Welcome. And thank you for joining us this morning in the Conservation Cropping Systems Initiative Soil Health webinar featuring Phil Needham. I'm Lisa Holscher, Director of the Conservation Cropping Systems Initiative, and let me introduce you to our CCSI team this morning. Jessica Hain, our Southern Program Manager, is going to be managing Phil's videos and PowerPoints remotely. Our Northern Program Manager, Sheila Schroeder, is going to be monitoring the questions that you're going to submit to Phil. And later on in the webinar, she'll be reading him aloud, aloud to him, and he'll be answering live from a field in Kentucky. Joe Lorick, our agronomist, will also be monitoring the questions, and he's providing some tech support behind the scenes. Live from a field in Western Kentucky, we have Phil Needham, the star of the show, and his son, Benjamin, is out there as well, serving as our cameraman. Let me introduce you to Phil Needham. Phil came to the United States in 1989 as a wheat agronomist with Miles Moore. If you're from Southern Indiana or Kentucky, you're familiar with that organization. He helped farmers with their wheat production to increase yields and especially to increase profitability. About 20 years ago, he really recognized the importance, the critical importance of no-till and cover crops, those type of soil health practices that help reduce erosion, help improve soil functionality, and help improve the resilience of those crops. About 15 years ago, he started Needham Ag Technologies and continues to consult with farmers in small grain production, and he also works with them in the modification, setup, and adjustments of their equipment to really perform exceptionally well in high residue systems. Let's throw it to Phil out in the fields of Western Kentucky. All right, well, good morning, everyone. Thank you, Lisa, for that very kind introduction. So a little background, I'm standing in a field in Western Kentucky. We're not far from Owensboro, which is on the Indiana border, close to the Ohio River. We're about an hour uh, drive west, or almost west, to Illinois. So we're in an area that gets quite a bit of rainfall and we're able to double crop. And for those people watching outside our immediate area, they may not be familiar with double crop and I'm just gonna explain that term briefly. Double crop is basically an area that's south enough with enough accumulated day degrees and enough moisture to be able to get a second crop after the wheat is harvested. And I'm standing in an example of that right now. So this wheat was harvested in late June. We normally harvest wheat here in Western Kentucky, mid June, late June perhaps early July, and right after, preferably, the wheat is harvested, we're going in here with a planter or a drill or an air seeder. This was planted with a drill, and we're planting what we call double crop soybeans into the wheat stubble, and we've got enough growing degree days and moisture here most years to get a double crop bean crop. So we're essentially harvesting two crops in every field during that year. So the principles that we're gonna be discussing today in this field are specific to soybeans, no tilled into wheat stubble, and this field made 90 to 100 bushels. So there's quite a bit of residue on the soil surface, but this, the, the practical uh, nature of this video will obviously cover all environments. This wheat, which was pretty uniform, and we'll look at it in, in more detail in a minute, was no tilled into corn stalks. The soybeans was no tilled, into wheat. So we've got a system of no-till here. So if you don't mind, Ben, why don't you zoom in on what we've got right here. So earlier on today, we've got a spade here, as you can see, and basically we got some recent moisture, and we'll talk about moisture in, in just a few minutes. But a soybean is a really good plant to show you what's going on in the soil. For example, this plant has been seeded for approximately two weeks. It's starting to nodulate, actually but it's rooted downwards, relatively vertical, and that's obviously what we want. Compared to this one that was in a wheel track, you can see how the root went downwards and then obviously extended out horizontally. It's still nodulating, but a soybean is a very good crop to show you issues with soil compaction. So by looking at soil quality, obviously it's moist. We've had some rains recently. I'll explain that here in just a minute. But we've got a really, like, really nice soil structure here. There was earthworms present earlier on, a lot of residue present. And if you look in this area right here, 
you can see the remains of the wheat residue, chaff and straw both, and we'll identify the importance of both of these here in a minute. So if you would, would you show the, the video of the 1560 drill? So what we've got in the background is the 1560 drill, and, and uh, this field was planted with a drill. One of the challenges that we have here in, in Western Kentucky is we get infrequent heavy rains. And if you don't mind, would you run the video? Uh, the video is called runoff video. Would you run that for us, please? Basically what we've got going on right here, approximately two weeks ago, we had a heavy rainfall event where it rained approximately eight and a half inches over the period of about six or eight hours. And we're starting to see more frequent rainfall events. So not only heavy rain, but fr the frequency of the heavy rains. Maybe that's climate change, maybe it's not. But the bottom line, what I'm showing you here is a field that was worked. Uh, it was actually worked after wheat, which is not what we recommend. And you can see there's a huge amount of runoff off that field with topsoil, with sediment, with nutrients, all running off that field. Obviously not what we want. So in this same field, and it's not more than one or two miles away from the video example that you see on the screen. And if you take it back to me again, if you would please, this same field that I'm standing in right now had the same amount of rainfall. So we got good residue standing, preferably standing. I want to leave as much residue standing tall. The taller the better, obviously collect the wheat heads and get them all harvested, don't leave some wheat heads. But the taller you can leave the wheat stubble standing, obviously the better for two or three different reasons. Number one, the taller you can cut it, the less opportunity you're giving the combine to screw up the residue distribution out of the back. Okay, so number one, the less material that you're ingesting with the combine, the better because it's less pressure on the chopper spreaders at the back to, to distribute it. From a plantability perspective, the taller the residue you leave it, especially corn stalks, if you're no-tilling wheat into corn stalks, leave the stalk standing as tall as possible because the more you leave standing, the opener kind of filters its way through the residue and it doesn't have to cut through it. And that's really important with all drills when you no-till it. Now, if you can zoom in again on me, Bench, what we've got here is, is, is straw and chaff. And today it's, it's cloudy. It's, we got a little shower last night. So we're, 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 more, we're wet on the soil surface, as you can see. And obviously you wouldn't be no-tilling in, into an environment like this. But when you've got cloudy days, and it's not drying, the residue's tough, just like what we've got right here. It hairpins crazy bad with any drill. So if you've got a planter equipped with residue managers or row cleaners, as they're also called, you can part some of this residue out of the way, which really helps. But with a drill, there's not any good row cleaner options for many different reasons, principally because the rows are too close together and there's nowhere to go with the residue. But it's really important to spread residue whether you're planting a cover crop, whether you're planting uh, double crop soybeans, whatever you're planting, it absolutely begins with uniform residue distribution at harvest time. And if you would, Jessica, would you show the video? I think it's called uh, JD9860. All right, so just a basic exam example starting out. This is a John Deere combine. Uh, what you've got there is, uh, what you've got there is a 35 foot platform, I believe that is a flex draper. Uh, and that combine, just by means of a simple initial example, is only spreading what residue, what appears to be about 20 feet, not very good at all. And obviously there's settings, but that's a tough field of soybeans, green stem beans that obviously don't spread as wide. I know there's dust coming out the back, but look at some of the green material in the picture. It shows you some of the challenges associated with harvesting tough crops that don't spread very well. So bring me now in, if you would please, the Lexion 740 video, please. So what we've got coming up next is a uh, short video uh, showing a Lexion combine, which we like. That's got a 35 uh, auger platform on it. And if you watch that video, you can see it's doing a pretty good job distributing chaff and straw separately across the harvesting width of the combine. And that's really important. 
Now I must know in that example, it was probably in the middle of the daytime. I took that video four, five, six years ago with the drone, as you can see, but the residue was dry. The moisture of the wheat was dry. The moisture content of the residue was, was, was pretty dry, as you can see. It's chopping it up good. And you can spread residue fairly well when it's dry, which is a complete contrast to the last image I showed where the combine wasn't spreading residue evenly. And if you're not spreading residue evenly, it presents all kinds of challenges from a point of view of seeding any crop, whether it's double crop soybeans, whether it's a cover crop, you know, whether it's wheat into corn stalks, if you can't spread that residue evenly, it makes it increasingly difficult to get a stand. There's also the dif differentials in nutrients from a point of view of the nutrients contained within the residue. And there's also the big challenge of soil warming. If the residue is dense, the soil underneath it is slow to warm. If there's little to no residue, obviously in those examples, uh, it warms much faster. So you want a field that dries evenly so it can be planted in similar conditions. You can close the seed slot. You can get uniform emergence to kind of get the higher yields that we're looking for. So by contrast, would you show me the, the John Deere 680 with Powercast video, Jessica, please, which is the next one, I believe. So what we've got coming up next is a 40 foot head on a John Deere 680 with a Powercast tailboard. And the Powercast tailboards really struggle to distribute residue more than about 30 to 35 feet in most conditions. And that's shown by the video here. So they often struggle. And if you speed the, sp uh, the spreaders up any more to try and spread it wider, they, obviously, they often distribute a heavier band to one or both sides with less in the middle. So they really don't distribute residue very evenly at all. Would you show the next video, which is the advanced power cast? So I would guess five years ago, six maybe, John Deere released the advanced power cast in North America. That's a platform that's been used in Europe uh, for a lot of years, maybe five or 10 years ahead of its release in North America. And I've, I've obviously got to make mention of this in which a lot of the European producers, which is where that tailboard originated, are very, obviously they're harvesting higher yielding crops. High yielding crops obviously means more residue. And they're really, really particular when it comes to residue management at the back of the machine. And we've got some different videos on YouTube. Uh, we can maybe link to them later on or discuss them later on. But there's all kinds of things that you can, in, you can do to improve residue management uh, by setting them up, by changing the blades, by speeding up the spreaders, by adjusting vanes if it's a tailboard type, st style spreader. But the bottom line is a lot of the, the European farmers are purchasing the better choppers and spreaders like this one that we're showing here, which is the advanced power cast from, from John Deere. Until recently, some of the dealers weren't aware this was even an option, which is bizarre. But the bottom line is there are, with most brands of combines, higher quality, better chopper spreader combinations to help you spread residue wider, preferably all the way across the header width, okay? A lot of farmers aren't buying them. You know, they're buying leather seats and fancy options in the cab, but they're not spending the extra five or $10,000 on the better choppers and spreaders for the back. So this is pretty important to think about. And uh, take it back to me again, if you would. So to conclude this, at least this part of the session, to conclude this, at least this part of the session, again, we're standing in a field, uh, double crop beans starting to emerge, as you can see behind me, did a reasonably good job uh, getting through the residue in this field. And what we're going to do here in just a minute is we're going to walk back to the drill. Uh, we're going to be talking about the drill. The only thing that Bench reminded me was, uh, let's come over here. And I just wanted to show what I call clumping of residue. And for whatever reason, at harvest time, you know, we've got a clump of residue here. And this is frequently caused in tougher conditions. Uh, when the machine, and if you watch some of them videos closely and, and maybe you can review them back at a later time, if the residue is a little bit on the tough side, a lot of these choppers and spreaders tend to clump material out of the back of the combine. You get little handfuls of material that look like this. And it's almost impossible to cut through these 
with any drill or planter because it's like braided wire. There's just too many uh, layers of material and you really can't cut through it. So anything that you can do to do a good job spreading residue, again, we've got videos on, on YouTube and there's lots of different things that you can do to improve the performance of these. But it really begins with selecting the right chopper spreader for the back of the machine. And lastly, never putting a head on the front of the machine that's wider than what the chopper at the back or the spreader at the back can distribute residue over. I sometimes see guys putting 45 foot platforms or even 40 foot platforms sometimes on combines and the chopper at the back spreading 30 or 35 feet. So you're just asking for streaks, you're asking for problems if you can't spread residue evenly across the working width. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna move back to the drill. Uh, Lisa, do we have any questions that we can answer while we're walking back to the drill? So basically what we're doing now, we're walking so back to a- Joe Rorick, I have a- Go ahead, I've got Joe. a question Go for ahead, you, Phil, Joe. while we're while we're walking. Um, so sometimes we hear about um, farmers being pretty opinionated, whether they like big pieces of residue and small pieces of residue. Um, and so they'll they'll take some of the knives out of the back of their combine, or or they'll they'll do different things. What's uh, what's your stance on that? Do you do you like big pieces of residue? Do you like smaller pieces of residue um, that'll break down faster? Do you want them bigger so they cover the soil better? Um, maybe spread a little better. What do you what do you think? What do you think there? So I always like longer pieces of residue, just because longer pieces of residue spread better. And the other, the other observation is longer pieces of residue remain longer on the soil surface. And that's important because here in the Midwest, and I've not done this research, I've just read about it, but it takes in, in the Midwest four or 5,000 pounds of additional, or I should say added organic matter every year in the form of crop residue, I mean. It takes four or 5,000 pounds of crop residue annually to maintain soil organic matter here. So the more you chop the residue, number one, the more difficult it is to spread it. Number two, the faster it breaks down. Now, if you're in North Dakota or Manitoba, you probably want residue to, to, to break down faster. So perhaps in those environments, it's different. You need to chop it finer. But where we are in Kentucky, we don't really want to size residue smaller. I don't like chopping corn heads. I'd rather leave the residue taller and standing and no-till into them taller stalks that are two foot tall, let's say, preferably taller if you can tolerate that. It looks kind of odd, but the taller you can leave residue, the easier it is to plant into. I don't want to run a chopping corn head close to the ground because there's so much residue to try and cut through. It's horrible trying to get an established stand of, of no-till wheat in them environments. So I would say leave the residue as long as possible within our region because we don't want it to break down very fast and we want to spread it evenly. So we're, in, we're standing now next to the John Deere 1560 drill. This is our own drill and we do a lot of research for different manufacturers and this is one uh, project that we've been working on for three years. So this was actually a prototype for precision planting and this is what we call a cedar force system with row by row. And this was the first one they put on a drill. They had some prototypes out with air cedars prior to this, but we had the first prototype that went on a drill. And principally what this is, it has the standard John Deere single disc row, row unit, as everybody's familiar with, on seven and a half inch spacing. But it has a hydraulic cylinder here, from here down to here. And the hydraulic cylinder is adjusted, meaning the down pressure is adjusted using a strain gauge on the depth adjust, which is right here. Maybe we can show videos of that a little bit later on, but it's basically sensing the amount of down force on the gauge wheels and on a row by row basis, it is adjusting down force all the way across the drill. And if you would, uh, we've got a, a an image, could you bring up the image, Jessica, please? It's called Jesse Map. And what we've got coming up here is a field that was in wheat. It was harvested with a combine with a 35 foot head. So the angle, the direction of the, of the, of the drilling was about 
45 degrees, it, it, it appears, to the direction of the combine passes. So in this example, the drill is actually adjusting automatically on a row by row basis, the amount of down pressure in response to the varying residue distributed by the combine out of the back. So you can see red lines horizontally across the screen at an angle to the direction of the drills, which appear to be about 45 degrees, as we can see. So it's changing the down pressure on a row by row basis, and that is huge. I mean, 10 years ago, or whatever it was, Precision Planting released the 2020, which from the cab was giving you assurance that every individual row unit was achieving target seeding depth, or not, as the case may be, and you stop and make adjustments until it was. And then more recently, they brought out the Delta Force for planters, which I really like, because that obviously adjusts row unit down force on a row by row basis. So you're achieving target down pressure on every planter row unit without too much down pressure to cause sidewall compaction and other issues. So this is principally exactly the same in which they've got a Delta Force system on a drill. And we really like what it does. And it sounds like a sales pitch. We're not a precision planting dealer. We don't sell these. We've just researched it now. This is the third year we've used it. We really like what it does. Even the, the tractor wheel tracks, you can see differences in sprayer tracks, combine tracks, grain cart tracks, tracks following the tractor that's pulling the drill. You can see differences in, in down pressure. So would you show me the Panther planting video, Jessica? This is a good example of what a, an active system can do. So this is a wheat field. So we're basically no-tilling wheat into corn stalks. Uh, this was a video from fall 2019. And if you watch this closely, we're, we're, this is an active video that's actually sped up by a factor of like 25 or 20, I believe. And you can see the impact that time of day had, meaning how damp or dry, the residue was through the day. So you can see on that video, we'll let it roll again, the time of day. So he, he started in the field, got late in the day, it started getting tough. Uh, he started again the next morning and you can see to the, to the line how much down pressure was required in response to the changing moisture conditions within the residue. So again, it's a system that actively adjusts down pressure in response to soil conditions or residue conditions. So as the residue gets tougher, the down pressure increases, it's that simple. It does it automatically with regards to strain sensor. And I believe it senses and adjusts three or five times a second. I'd have to confirm what it does. So it's a fast system that adjusts to the terrain and the residue conditions. So watch that video again if you've got time later on. And there's differences in topography in that field also, but you can see the line transition between when the residue was drier and the residue was damper. So pretty interesting technology. And I think a lot of people have been using this technology for a number of years in the form of 2020, and more recently in the form of Delta Force on planters. And like I say, it's a system that we really like, and there's others out there. It's not just precision planting that offer it. So if you would close that video out, and uh, Lisa, we're going to turn it back to you and uh, see if there's any more questions. And I have a question text to me. Um, he wants to know what the cost of a, the system is on a drill like this, the precision would, planting. I, I, I would, I, I don't know. You need to get a hold of your precision planting dealer. This is somewhat of a prototype. Well, it is a prototype, it, or it was a prototype. And is the video back on me again? Okay. Yes. So the, the background is, this is a Case Maxim 125. It's our tractor. Uh, this tractor does not have sufficient hydraulic flow, and it has an open flow system, and you really need a, a closed flow system. Uh, so this tractor does not have sufficient oil flow to run this drill. So the only way we can run this drill with this tractor was to get this power pack, which is basically a PTO pump like some planters have. And I think this develops around 20 gallons a minute of flow, and it might be 25, but I'm in the ballpark. So there's a lot of things going on with this that most farmers wouldn't have and wouldn't need because we don't have a tractor really big enough to power this drill. So 
I can't answer that. It's specific to drill. Uh, what the you need, I would suggest that any farmer interested in such a system needs to talk to a precision planting dealer, tell him what kind of drill they've got, tell him the row spacing. Ideally, it's narrow because we like the narrower rows for wheat. But uh, yeah, I'd have them touch base with a precision planting for, for current pricing. So, Phil, I've heard you talk before in some other other conferences, um, and you've talked about the importance of weight on a drill, and maybe I missed that while you were talking. Could could you go over that again? So it's pretty important to have adequate weight on a drill if you're no-tilling into tough soils hard soils, heavy residues, or especially combinations of all of the above. Uh, pretty sure this drill's got 12 100 pound weights on it. And I'm always astonished that some growers out there are no-tilling with no weights on the back. And there's more out there than, than what you'd believe. But the bottom line is, regardless of whether you got the precision planting system with row by row or not, uh, with any no-till drill, if you want to achieve, achieve target seed and depth in heavy residue or hard soils or both, you're going to have to add more ballast in most conditions. Now, if the soils are mellow, the ground's wet, it's a non-issue. Probably weights aren't required, but I'm saying there's a lot of growers out there that I've seen even this year, no-tilling uh, wheat, no-tilling soybeans into wheat, for example, and they don't have adequate ballast for the conditions. You can see they haven't from experience. I can tell them they haven't. So it's almost a topic in itself, but you've got to have adequate ballast for any system on a drill to be able to achieve target seed and depth in, in heavy residue, especially tough residue. I have another question that was texted to me. Do you have an estimate of yield losses due to bad residue spreading? We've done trials in which we have, with a small plot combine, you know, with a four foot head, we have intentionally gone out in fields and harvested just a short run. You know, we've measured out a 20 foot area and cut the ends off and, and compared areas that had poor stands, primarily as a result of residue spread, and compared them to areas between the combine patches that had good residue spread. And we've seen 30 or 40 bushel per acre differences side by side, 30 foot apart, and we did it two or three times to get some replication. So I'm gonna tell you in wheat, I've seen 30 or 40 bushel yield losses as a result of poor residue distribution. Now that would be on the high end, but I'm gonna say there's a lot of people losing yields to poor residue spread, but they wouldn't be in that range. Practically, there'd be a lot of guys with maybe five bushel per acre of a, of, of a yield loss. Okay, Phil, um, do you have a feeling for, we've, we've been encouraging, excuse me, we've been, we've been looking at seeding cover crops, multi-species cover crops after wheat. Do you have an idea of how much of an issue the residue spread is for that cover crop emergence? I mean, we've done different field days where we've looked at emergence, and I think there's another video on YouTube that actually talks about this at a field day that we did in Indiana. Uh, but yeah, res it, I didn't mention it enough, but leaving residue tall and standing is a huge part. And I just see a lot of people where the wheat's standing good, the wheat's a taller variety, 36 inches tall or 38 inches tall or more and guys are mowing it next to the ground. If you make baling straw, that's a different deal, but if you run it all through the combine, chopping it and spreading it, uh, you need to leave the residue as tall and standing as possible because it's so much easier to get a better stand through standing residue, okay? So yeah, it's just as important with any kind of cover crop, I'm sure, uh, especially the smaller seeded cover crops because you need to be seeding them shallower and it's more difficult to get uniform seeding depth in heavy residue when you're seeding shallower. So 
some of the cover crops would be in that category. They need to be planted shallower. So I'm going to say it's vitally important that you spread residue evenly for any crop, especially including shallow planted cover crops. Okay, the next question I have is, can we get European style residue spreaders on our combines? Are those systems well, much better? Here's the story, and I've spent time at Silvis, Illinois, which is the John Deere R&D facility not far south of Harvester Works. And this is 10 years ago, so I'm gonna give them credit because they've made some changes, and it might have been 12 years ago. But back then, one of the marketing guys for John Deere Combines made the comment that American farmers didn't care about residue management. And he may have been just, you know, looking at the, the Midwestern area. I mean, they went on to, to tell me that most of the combines that they sell in Indiana, Iowa, Minnesota, and maybe Nebraska, I think they said 60% of the combines that they marketed went into that region. It may have been Indiana. But they said, you know, how much no-till is there in a lot of those areas? And, and some of those states I've just mentioned, like Iowa, they don't have a lot of no-till. So if guys are working the field, they're chiseling it, they're plowing it, whatever, you know, they're burying some of the issues. You've also got to think about where the people are that made that comment. I mean, if you're in Silvis, Illinois or Davenport, Iowa, what, what, do you, what do you see when you look out of the office? You see work ground, probably. So... Residue management doesn't really rise to the top as a, as a, as a concern in, in some of those areas. Now, I'm always working with no-till growers. I'm kind of the guy that goes to a lot of these manufacturers, telling them you need better choppers and spreaders, and that's part of the reason for that visit that time. But uh, the advanced power cast that I showed in the video a little while ago is one of the European technologies that John Deere now offers in this country. And like I said in the video, until recently, some dealers weren't even aware that it was available. And that may have been smart on John Deere's point, uh, behalf because they, wanna, they probably want to test it in different conditions, in more crops, just to make sure it performs better before they go out with a nationwide rollout. But the bottom line is most combine manufacturers have better choppers and spreaders, but you have to ask the dealer. And sometimes the dealers aren't up to speed with some of them technologies. So... Obviously, a manufacturer's website generally has that kind of information. Or if you're, if you're at, a, at a farm show, assuming it's not shut down like some of them are, or a lot of them are this year with COVID-19, find a manufacturer rep because those guys are generally the ones that are very confident answering questions with regards to chopper configurations and product offerings. Sometimes the dealerships are a, a year or two behind that because they're not comfortable promoting and recommending things they haven't seen before. So a short answer to, or a long answer to a short question, most manufacturers have the better technologies, but a lot of farmers aren't buying them. Like I said, I'm not joking. Farmers are buying fancy cab options with leather seats, but they're buying the cheapest chopper option at the back, and that's not right. They need to be the other way around. Phil, it looks like you've got some different closing wheels on that drill. Can you talk a little bit about closing wheels? So we do a lot of work improving drills and planters, running them in different conditions. And we've had a lot of rainfall. I mentioned we had eight and a half inches of rain. So we've been running drills in, intentionally in, in higher moisture conditions. And that's part of what we've been doing here. You can even see some mud stuck to some of the, some of the opener arms. And, and we're basically testing and evaluating factory wheels, which is this one. So this is just a John Deere cast wheel that is in reasonable condition, meaning it's got a relatively sharp edge on the side. We see a huge amount of closing wheels like this, but worn, meaning they become rounded when viewed from above. And when these wheels become rounded and worn from above, they really don't close very well at all, especially in higher moisture no-till conditions. So this is a wheel that we designed, Martin manufacture, manufactures it actually for us. It's called a 20-point crumbler wheel. It's half an inch thick. It's made of T1 material, so it's an extremely long life, much longer lasting material than the cast that John Deere uses. But these wheels will close the slot many times better than standard cast wheels like this and last a lot longer, especially in the higher moisture no-till conditions. Then we've got a V8 firming wheel here that we designed 
10 years ago, we've made some modifications to it, but it just does a better job pressing seeds down into the bottom of the seed slot. And if you look at a brand new John Deere Pro Series drill that they released in July of uh, 2018, I think, at the Progress Show in, in Canada, uh, you know, the new Pro Series has a wheel that looks almost exactly like us. So you can't help but think the engineers at John Deere aren't paying a lot of attention to what we're doing here because they're copying a lot of our ideas. So that's, that's some of the things on the drill. We got some good product videos on, on YouTube. If you type Needham Ag 750 or Needham Ag John Deere 1850, pick the model of drill you've got. And there's quite a few videos on there that talk about some of these modifications for drills and air seeders, okay? Are there any more questions, Lisa? Yep, I've got another, another one. Bill. So, go ahead, Joe. So when you walk up to a drill, when you walk up to a drill, what are the some of the first things that you look for? So when you visit a farm and, and you've never seen a drill before, or that drill before, what are some of the first things you start looking at? when you? So the big things, or certainly the most important things, is always disc diameter. A brand new disc on a John Deere single disc drill measures 18 inches in diameter, okay? When they drop below 17 inches in diameter, they lose their sharp cutting edge and they don't cut very well, especially in hard conditions, tough residue, hard soils with tough residue on top especially. So you've absolutely got to begin with a sharp disc, preferably 17 inches or greater in size. And then look at all of the components, wiggle the row unit side to side. This is pretty tight, it should be. But a, a lot of times we look at older drills the pivot here at the top front of the closing wheel arm, you can wiggle them side to side a half inch or more. And if that closing wheel doesn't work in close proximity to the seed slot, it's not gonna do a good job closing, okay? So the big things, this diameter, condition of the seed boot, the closing wheel pivots, the firming wheel arm pivots, I mean, just look at an opener, wiggle an opener, move the opener side to side, see what plays in there because oftentimes you know a closing wheel arm bushing kit may only be thirty dollars a row or, or or in that order it's not a lot of time putting them on but they can have a big impact on closing if that closing wheel arm wiggles side to side a half inch or more so i feel like a lot of drills and air seeders out there in the industry don't get the best attention they don't get the best maintenance a lot of farmers are maintaining their planters to a much better standard. But these are important too for double cropping soybeans like we've talked about, for planting your cover crops. I mean, you need a drill that's in good shape. So these are some of the things that you need to be thinking about to, to ensure that. Okay, so I have a question. Um, let me pull this up again. Does Phil like the... Sh do you like the Schlegel type closing wheels? And I hope I pronounced that right. You know, we've looked at the Schlegel closing wheels. I talked to growers in Kansas and Nebraska that are generally seeding into conditions with a little loose soil on top. And I think in those environments, that's where they fit. That's where they work and that's where they work really well where they absolutely don't work, and I've got pictures in presentations that we use, is they don't work in higher moisture soils, partly because the teeth are angled, partly because they just flat out don't close the slot very well in moist soils. And if you're in a longer term no-till system and you've got a little bit more aggregation, a little bit more soil quality towards the soil surface, they work better. But I'm just saying in shorter term no-till, especially moist clay soils, they don't close very well at all. So pick your environment, try some, find something that you think will work for your soils and just try it. Run a few feet, ideally test it for a year. We always keep this cast closing wheel on this drill in the center just for a comparison. You always need a benchmark to see what you're doing and how much better it's doing than, than, than other wheels or worse as the case may be. So yeah, try some different wheels would be my suggestion. Oh, 
I don't see any more questions coming in on my end. Um, I think that you've got one more video. Did you want to run through that? It's uh, um, Ben planting on the planting on Barnett. Yeah, go ahead and show that video if you would. I, I, I'm sorry, I'd forgotten we didn't show that video. So what we're showing here is Ben using the 1560 with a precision planting cedar force with row by row, and he's planting double crop beans into tall wheat stubble, which is obviously what we want and what we want to promote. The gauge wheels on that driller are 16 inches in diameter, and in some areas of that field, the, the residue's uh, tall enough in which it's almost as, as tall as the top of the gauge wheel. So leave residue tall and standing. We're, we're kind of into a conclusion here, but kind of a wrap up, spread your residue evenly. Don't select combine heads any wider than the combine can spread residue over. So spread it evenly, spend some time making adjustments. So I know it's a busy time and you want to move on, but spend some time making adjustments to choppers and spreaders because some of the simplest adjustments often make a big difference. So once you spread the residue well, set your drill up. Ideally, it's already uh, been looked over and you've made some changes to it and you've added sufficient ballast and the discs are sharp. You know, make sure it's set up and ready to roll for the conditions that you're planting into. But you basically in the video that you're seeing now, you can see, if you look closely, you can see the row units extending down and raising up in response to different topographies, different soil types, different residue levels in that field. And that's why we really like the cedar force. It is an active system. You know, there's other systems out there with a hydraulic cylinder that give you consistent down pressure, or they claim consistent down pressure all the way across the drill, but you don't need it the same. The wheel tracks on, on the tractor in front often leave a, a depression or a denser soil uh, or an increased soil density in which you need more down pressure in the wheel tracks. And then when you're running across heavy, dense areas of residue or wheel tracks from grain carts or combines, you know, you need the ability to increase the down pressure in them row units. And this absolutely does that. Joe, Sheila, are you seeing any additional questions coming in? There aren't any questions as of now. Okay. Well, you know, we want to be mindful of everybody's time today. So, um, Phil, do you have any closing comments that you'd like to make? Like As I said in the video, we've got a lot, and I don't remember how many, 60 or 70, I think, different videos on YouTube talking about drills, talking about air seeders, talking about planters, talking about residue distribution. We've got one that we did in Indiana, Lisa, with, with your group, talking about cover crops and establishing cover crops into residues. So there's a pile of resources on YouTube. Type in Needham Ag, and there should be, a, I think, a group or a... Our, uh, uh, what's the name of it on YouTube? Our group, I guess, uh, is called Needham Ag. So if you click that group, there's 60 or 70 different videos that you can select the ones that would be most interest. But there is some on there that talk about residue distribution on specific brands of combines, some specific adjustments that you can make and improvements that you can make to spread residue. So there's a lot of resources on YouTube, and that's, that's a media that we use a lot. There's also a, a discussion group on YouTube that we look at quite a bit. I think it's called John Deere Single Disc Openers. It's a, for those of you who use Facebook, I'm sorry, if, on, if you use Facebook, uh, there's a group called John Deere Single Disc Openers. I think that's what it's called. And it's got a lot of members and every day people are a asking questions and different growers are answering questions about John Deere drills. So that's, that's pretty useful and we look at that quite a bit. So there's a lot of resources out there, YouTube and Facebook would obviously be two of them that would give you more information.